Well, I see a bunch of familiar faces. <laughs> um, I guess I'm not a historian, but I have had property in the town of Dayton since 1976. And what got me started on all of this was that when we got our abstract of title at the closing of purchasing the property, I found out that the first owner was Lyman Dayton. I thought, well, wait a minute, this is the town of Dayton. So then I was at the uh, Red Mill and I saw the book called Rural on the Crystal, had to buy it, and lo and behold, what's the first story in there? How Mrs. Van Horn hiked over four miles from her house bringing buckwheat over to use Mrs. Dayton's coffee grinder to grind her buckwheat. Now I have to get a coffee grinder, right? So I was going to auctions and I ended up getting a little box coffee grinder, you know, the kind with the handle that turns on top. And that was symbolic, okay? I had no idea what kind of coffee grinder she really had. I figured it must be a big one with the wheel on the side, you know? Well then, when we had our 165th anniversary of the township two years ago, I got acquainted with John Huffteaser and his cousin Paul, who are descendants of Lyman Dayton. And Paul one day showed up at my house with a coffee grinder. Guess whose? <laughs> and it was identical to the one I had bought at the auction just for a symbol, but it was a little bigger. You'll, whoops. You'll, you'll see it in the slides. So anyway, that's my pedigree. I've been... <laughs> I, I've just been, you know, it's been kind of a, one thing led to another, to another, to another. I had no idea how many hours and how much research I would end up putting in. I know more about this than I do about my own genealogy. So with that, um, let's get started. The town was officially established, as you can see, December 7th, 1852. And um, it was cut off, or uh, maybe I shouldn't say cut off, but it was it was divided off from the town of Lind um, here in the southwest corner of Wapaka County. And we're almost all blue. It, you know, it's the bottom most left uh, square on there, township, which means we have very sandy soil. Let's see here. Okay, and here are some of the demographics. Um, I'm not going to read it to you. I do know that early on they considered Crystal Lake Corners also as one of the unincorporated communities, but if you go online now, you don't find that anymore. Sorry, Bill, but it seems to have disappeared. <laughs> Whoops. So uh, a little frame of reference, and again, I'm not going to read all of this. You can gather what you wish, but... Wisconsin achieved statehood in, 19, uh, in 1848, and um, the 1840s were still a very much a frontier out in this area, and um, the 1850s, which was right around the corner from statehood, um, were, we had all kinds of conditions in the country that would ultimately lead to the Civil War. Oh, I keep getting off the wrong button. So when Wisconsin became a state, this is what the U.S. flag looked like. It was the 30-star flag. And then when Dayton became a township, one more star was added for California. So if you flew the flag, that's what it would be. Um, in the county, I don't know if you can see that very well or not, but the top on the left shows the town of Lind, and it only shows six townships in the county. But then to the right at the top, you can see that Dayton and Lind are there. And just to give you an idea of how the evolution went. And then um, there were more diagrams in the series, but since this isn't about the county, I didn't bring them on. This also is almost impossible to read, but this is the document that actually uh, is from the minutes of the meeting that formed the town of Dayton, and it's the second paragraph in there. 
but it's, of course, handwritten. A uh, little bit more about history. 1852 in particular, Massachusetts workers struggled for a 10-hour day. They were working 14 to 15 hours, and that wasn't only in Massachusetts, of course. Um, finally, um, they conceded to an 11-hour day. Uncle Tom's Cabin was written that year. There were earthquakes in California um, in November, just a couple weeks before we became a township. And another notable thing, the first train west of the Mississippi traveled five miles within Missouri. But people got all excited because they thought, if it could go five miles, maybe it can go all the way across the country. So things were, things were happening. Um, this is a little bit out of the book Rural on the Crystal that I'm sure many of you probably have, um, showing what the early assessment was, the first assessment, and then the state tax, and the county share, and the county school tax, and so forth. Um, I think you would like to know, just for uh, comparison, that um, in 2018, the town of Dayton's assessment was $374,008,098 compared to, what is that up there? I can't even read it from here. 9,600 something? Yeah. So uh, things have changed. There is an early map of the, of the township and um, if you look at the T, just slightly up above it, like at about 1 o'clock, is a little symbol for schoolhouse. And that was uh, one of the first schools in, in the township. That's another early map. Can you read anything on the map? I, I don't know if, how they're showing up for you. Okay, then I'll, I'll just kind of go past these. Um, this one was between 1883 and 1910, and I know that because the name that's on the place where I live owned it from those years. I did not find a date on the map itself. Here's Parfreyville. You can see it had a mill pond. And this is actually what is now called Little Hope. And those two black rectangles are the two mills at the Red Mill. One was for um, grinding corn and whatever grains were fed to cattle. And the other one was for grinding flour for people. There is an early map of the town of rural, or I should say, the hamlet. They are officially called hamlets, these little unincorporated communities. And this is just a, a plat book from 1889. And uh, since these aren't readable, I'm just going to flip by them fast. OK, let's go to the people. Um, Wisconsin came out of what was called the Northwest Territory from after the Revolution. Uh, Britain had owned the land, and of course they lost the war. So um, ultimately, the Northwest Territory got divided into several states, including Wisconsin. Here in this township, most of the early settlers were American-born citizens. They weren't immigrants. Somebody back generations in their family were the ones who came mainly from Europe, but most of the actual people that came here were from out east, the New England states, New York state. And of course, the explorers, mainly French, had predated the settlers. And then, like I said up here, before long, I mean long before, pardon me, the Native Americans were here. Of course, they weren't called Americans then. Um, these were all found in this area, and this is just uh, mattering. 
Uh, I don't know if you saw the little bibliographies. There's some on the table back there and some where you signed in. Uh, the very first entry in the bibliography, that book gets very boring to read because it has all the lakes in the chain and then other places, other waters and so forth in the area. And it, start, it, it says almost the same thing for every one about there were encampments there, there were middens found, there were spear points found. And none of these are arrowheads. These all predate um, the people here using bows and, and true arrows. Those are all spear points or knives or scrapers. Whoops, I went the wrong way. Excuse me. Um, there we go. I just I had to get back to here to us so I don't give you the wrong dates. The, these come from the early Paleo Indian through the Archaic to the late Woodland stages, 9,000 BC to 1,000 AD. Um, spears were thrown using something called an atlatl, A-T-L-A-T-L. -A -T -L. It was like an extra long stick, and, and it would just give them much more thrust. And amazingly enough, I mean, they could kill big animals hunting. So some of you may have noticed in King, there is one mound remaining at one of the properties over there. Okay, this I found on my own property. It's a clay pipe, and I did some research about clay pipes and found out that um, they dated back quite a long way. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh took tobacco back to England. I mean, that, I guess we all learned that in history somewhere along the line. Um, the voyagers used them. Indians, or pardon me, the Native Americans were using pipes of some sort and uh, they were really very popular um, for centuries. Okay, here are the Daytons, Lyman and Rowena, and they were the fourth people in Dayton to file a claim. Um, they came in 1880, which is before it was a township, and also Strangely enough, on my title, my abstract for my property, they're not the first entry. The first entry is somebody named John Fitzgerald. All I can think of is that he was a land speculator because he got it from, some, I presume, the widow of somebody who was in the War of 1812. Now, I don't know much about that history, but I'm thinking maybe soldiers from then were given title to land out there on the frontier as part of their mustering out or something, and then this speculator would come around and, you know, give the widows a few dollars and say, you know, you're never going to go there. I'll take that piece of paper. I don't know. I could be all wrong on that, but it's uh, interesting. Um, other early settlers in 1850 included George Van Horn and his wife Eleanor, and she's the one who the story in Rural and the Crystal is about bringing her buckwheat over to use Mrs. Dayton's coffee grinder to grind her buckwheat. And the buckwheat had been given to her by another settler who was going back to his home in Racine and had this crop there and said she could have it. Oh, try to get coordinated here. There's the coffee grinder, the the actual one, not not my ersatz one, <laughs> but mine looks just like that, only only a little smaller. So this is all actually over in the town hall. In there, we have a showcase out in the hallway of a few pieces of memorabilia. And if any of you have interesting items that you'd be willing to share. You don't even have to give them to us. You could loan them to us, and we could have a um, rotating display or something. Um, and 
when we had the uh, the anniversary, I figured Lyman Dayton's place needed a sign. When when I found out when we bought it back in 1976, I went over to uh, Norma Stromberg, and, and she's the one that wrote Rural on the Crystal, and um, just got to got to know her. And I said, well, how do I get one of those signs? Rural, this, they I have those nice signs, you know, by the houses of the early settlers, and. She politely told me I didn't live in rural, and that was just for people in rural. <laughs> oh, okay, because this isn't uh, not in rural. I'm a mile away from rural. So anyway, I made that sign two years ago and put it out on this stump that I refused to have cut down. I think it was a neat stump, and I don't know how long it's been there, but I liked it. Okay. Um, this is a genealogy. Surprise, surprise, John. Um, <laughs> well, um, John had given me uh, what he and his cousin had for uh, the genealogy that they knew of, and that was down. That's what's down on the bottom. But then I was poking around on the computer, and I found something—a site called Find a Grave—and. I tried looking up my own ancestors, and they're not on it. But I got back to Samuel Dayton, which would be, if you're putting greats in front of grandfather, he would be your great, your eight great grandfather. And um, he was born in Kent, England in 16, was it 24? And if he died in New York, I, I wonder, I mean, that I put up there because he married somebody in New York. So, and then all the rest were uh, born in Connecticut. Um, so, I'll print that out for you, John. <laughs> Whoops. Well, these little buttons keep getting, I'm sorry about this. Okay, now, not to be confused, when I was doing my research for the town's anniversary, my son, who lived in Minnesota at the time, in a city called Dayton, had just moved there, and the welcome wagon, or whoever it was, came and gave him a calendar, and it had a picture exactly like that on the calendar. And this was like, doo-doo-doo-doo, because this Lyman Dayton founded a city in Minnesota, around the same era as this Lyman Dayton was here in Wapaka County. So anyway, um, I thought I'd throw that in just because of the strange coincidence. Okay, here's another. Uh, this is a close-up so you can see it a little bit better. Um, but this is from at least 1883, because where it says H. Ernst on there now, right vertically next to the 15, right almost in the middle, um, that had been Lyman Dayton's property. And I got this picture from Olive Sawyer, and I don't remember if this was Hiram Ernst or if this was Norman Baker. Norman Baker was her father. Um, but anyway, this is what the house looked like back in the in in the uh, old days. Uh, and let's see here, who owned it then? Oh, uh, Zibel. Now, is this your relative? Z i e b e l l. Um, he had a place called. Um, Sunny, sunny slope, I think he called it. Well, that that house is gone now. Yes, we we very agonizingly we ended up tearing it down in 1999 and putting up something that would be more user-friendly. Okay, now here are a few pictures that were, were given to us uh, for the anniversary of the town. So 
I'm not going to read those. You can see that. Just some. Pardon me. Oh, Edward on there. That was your husband. Oh, wow. Well, he's the middle one in the back. Okay. Now, did you know him when you were kids? Oh. <laughs> Okay. Okay, and I saw Helen. Helen, was he your grandfather? Okay. I was surprised how many of the men in you know, I'll say in the historical times, went into politics. And I mean look at his look at his resume there. And here's another one. This goes back to John again. This he married uh who did he marry John? Susan? Okay. And I I put this in it's pretty much the same information you just saw but if you look at the uh, the last paragraph he got involved in something that must have been a scandal at the time. Uh he represented Charles Comiskey, owner of the White Sox in a trial <laughs> involving a suit for back wages because a couple years before that some players had been dismissed uh, because of a, wor uh, a World Series scandal. They, I guess, were told to. Yeah, Black Sox, 1919. yeah, 1919. Okay, what did they do? Through the game? Yes. Oh, now wait. Is wasn't he wasn't he one of the guys in Field of Dreams? Shoeless Joe. else, uh, a lawyer from this area that got into uh, politics, and his office is still standing in, in Wapaka, and still has lawyers in it. Margaret Ashman um, was a very well-known author. She wrote mainly uh, youth books, but she also wrote textbooks and um, poems. And kind of ahead of her time because she didn't marry, but she did adopt a child. This is something that we borrowed from the Rural Historical Society for our celebration. This is a childhood outfit, probably when he was about five years old, of Forrest Radley. And uh, I think he lived in the house that's just across from the a Weller store. And he worked at the post office in Wapaka, and then uh, the last several years before he retired, he was a mailman. And uh, that's his wife's, uh, a little bit from her obituary. Uh, she pioneered the school lunch program at Golden Hill School with another woman. And, well, you can see what else. She was uh, active in the Rural Historical Society and the Rural Cemetery Association. Uh, 
this man I had the pleasure of meeting. Um, he was from the town of Dayton, and he became an international expert uh, on drilling and water quality. And he had published a lot of uh, articles in a you know a professional magazine on on water wells. Uh, he built uh, well, let's see in Tunisia and. Uh, into the Sahara Desert, and just uh, Ethiopia, among other places. Uh, Roger Radley, I just had an email from him today because I found out that he came from rural. So I said, oh, town of Dayton. Um, he told me that he is now retired. But uh, anyway, he was um, an entertainer, and he specialized in um, conventions and conferences and, you know, special events kinds of things. He wrote skits for radio and TV, but he wasn't, he didn't appear on those uh, himself, but he was, he was uh, a comedian for 34 years after his work in the developmentally with the developmentally disabled. Originally, he thought he was going to be a lawyer, but he decided that wasn't the thing. And Kevin, our current representative, Lillian. We celebrated her. We celebrated her 95th birthday at the uh, 165th anniversary party because they coincided. And I just asked her if she knows of anybody in the in the township that's older. I mean, does anybody know somebody over 97 who lives in Dayton? And this is a relatively new uh, book, uh, Stratton Lake Mystery. It's youth literature written by Greg Biba, who lives on, on Stratton Lake Road and uh, teaches at the middle school. Um, this I got from uh, the Swensons. Well, I don't own it. I, they loaned it to me to, when I was doing this, this work. and. Uh, it's about a lot of the different cottages. They have different, you know, everybody's got their own page and it tells the story, uh, historical background and so forth. It's, it's really quite interesting to read. And um, of course, they're not all cottages in Dayton, but many of them are. Uh, this is a map that's available. Um, I put it together with the help of the, the county office, they gave me the, the blank map, and uh, it has various landmarks on it. And we, we have some of those over at the town hall available. This shows where the schools were. There were eight of them, and they're circled, but they're kind of hard to see. I can tell you what they were. There was Crystal Lake. And that was from 1868 to 1958. There was Dayton. They don't know when Dayton started, according to the research I did, but they know it closed in 1939. Golden Hill, which was in rural, um, started in 1957 or 58, had an addition put on it in 1930. And um, then it was the school, a new school was built. and. That one closed in 1973. McAllister School is another one that they don't know when it started, but it also closed in 1939. Parfreyville School um, started in a shanty in 1854, actually had a building in 1856, and closed in 1961. 
Pleasant Valley, unknown when it started, but it burned down in 1950 and never got rebuilt. Um, the students were absorbed into Rogers School in Dayton, and um, in 1942 they had nine students. Post Corners was another one. Uh, that one is down on um, Highway 22. It started as a log building in 1853, graduated to a shanty in 1859. I, I, to me, I think the log would probably be better than the shanty. I don't know. And um, went to a frame building in 1866. And um, they had privies. They built two privies, one for the boys and one for the girls in 1870. Now, what they did before that, they didn't say. <laughs> um, but then uh, Springwater and Rose Townships in Washera County were sending their kids there in 1903, and the school closed in 1944. And then there was Rogers School that went from 1869 to 1940. And school was kind of different back in those days. Um, they ha had two sessions, a uh, few months in the summer and a few months in the winter. It wasn't just, you know, start now and, and go until next summer. Oh, I forgot to mention more about Camp Cleghorn started as a temperance camp, a camp, um, and uh, I don't know if that's why Dayton was a dry, a dry township or not. But anyway, uh, it evolved into what it is today of being mostly privately home-held uh, cottages now. But they still have some of their earlier buildings that are in good condition, and they still use them. So it's kind of a hybrid, I guess. That's the Parfreyville School. And it may or may not have been the first one in the township. It depends on what you read. And there's uh, Post Corner School is a private home now, and it's behind the trees, but I wanted to get the sign. And I have to tell you, when I was taking this picture, I had my car on the side of the road, had the flashers going, and I'm walking back to, you know, get on the right side of the sign, and a car pulls up behind me, and all of a sudden it turned on all kinds of red lights. <laughs> yes? Oh. When I first saw the sign up, it looked like the building was not used. I don't know. I mean, there wasn't anything outside around it. When I went to take this picture, there was so much... 2019 stuff that I tried, you know, I thought, well, that's really going to detract from the from the, the building, so I, I guess I'll take the sign. But anyway, so the flashing lights, so the officer comes up, and <laughs> well, I told him what I was doing, but I thought, okay, he sees, he sees my car, which has a handicap license on it. He sees me hobbling with, you know, I didn't have my walker along, so I was just, you know, and, and I'm carrying my phone. So I'm sure he thought, oh my gosh, what happened to this woman? So I, I thanked him very much for being conscientious. <laughs> okay, now this is Golden Hill School. This is in rural, and it's on Arbor Street, and um, it was, uh, it's a private residence now. It was built in 1857 or 58, um, had an addition put on in 1890, and closed in 1930. Um, for a school, there was a new building put up on Main Street that 
uh, was closed in 1974, used as a real estate office for a while, and now it also is a private residence. But I think this is one of the prettiest ones, I mean, keeping the cupola off on it. And this is a, and it, just an example of the sign I couldn't get. <laughs> But I'm sure you've all seen these signs, and, and it just makes rural seem like such a special place. There's the halfway house, and uh, the halfway re referred to halfway between Berlin and Stevens Point. And um, I mentioned all those schools, but predating all of those schools, a daughter of Lyman Dayton, Elmira, had a quote-unquote private school that she conducted at the halfway house. And uh, if you've read Rural on the Crystal, it says that she put little marks on the windowsill and it was sort of like a, a sundial to know what time it was. And that's the Radley house, very elegant. And there is the rural store with the old rural store. Um, the older one had been across the road at one time, and I, I, um, I guess it was moved, obviously. This is the old town hall, and that was uh, taken over by the Rural Historical Society when our new town hall was built. I remember that we went in there to pay our taxes when we'd come up in January, and there was a stove. I think the stove is still in there, isn't it? Does anybody know? It's not? And there's a nice little uh, free library box there. And so I had to put this in. These are the ones, these are the ones that are in the town of Dayton. Um, if you want to know where they are in the zip code 54981, there's a, a little bookmark available at the library and at the Chamber of Commerce that I made about those. Here's our new town hall, and I still call it that, but I don't, you know, it's kind of silly. It's from 1996. And in the uh, records room in the storeroom over there, I saw this shelf of books and I thought, oh, that looks really cool. I mean, you know, the records really do go back. And then relatively recently, we have this uh, Lyman Dayton walking trail over there and um, you can go either direction and it's four tenths of a mile. And then we also have right in the middle there, um, a kind of an art piece that was made by a high school student uh, Jane, do you remember his name? Oh, okay. Okay, and here's the Parkerville Wayside, the best free show in town. Go over and watch the canoes in the summertime. And the Parkerville Cemetery. And uh, that one belongs to the town. I've got a couple in here relative to the Parkerville Church. Apparently, according to the more than one reference that I looked at, the first preaching in town was done by a Methodist minister by the name of Miller, and then a Reverend Cutting Marsh, who actually was based more uh, toward Green Bay for the Stockbridge Indians, who had been pushed out west from their uh, territory in the east. And um, Cutting Marsh, actually conducted some services at Lyman Dayton's house. There was also a Reverend Samuel Simcock, and, oh, well, there's a rock that you can hardly read, but anyway, I mean, I, can't, I, I couldn't read it when I went there, but um, it's just 
up the hill a little bit on Spencer Lake Road from from uh, the Parkerville Wayside, and uh, he also preached in about 1952 for about three years. And then there was a John Martin who preached at Pleasant Valley in the house of uh, the Thompsons. So. Oh, okay. I wonder. I wonder if I have that. I don't know. Tell me if it if it looks familiar, because I have another rock. <laughs> okay. Oh, the 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 rummage sale one that went by really fast. I the church happened to have their rummage sale when I was out taking pictures, and I thought rummage sales. That's one of the fun activities, <laughs> you know. Except for winter, we've got to have a rummage sale in here. Is how how appropriate a nice church rummage sale. So of course here's the Red Mill, and uh, that uh, was built in 1855 by a DC Barnum to grind grain, as we, I said before. Had two two um, well, I'd say a flat kind of water wheels. The big water wheel that we saw on the side for for many years was made by Sterling Schrock and it was just a, a tourist attraction, you know, when the Red Mill turned into a gift shop. And I didn't have a picture of Sterling, but I did find his uh, memorial, he and his wife. And they, he had a house on, on the Radley Crick and they called, well, they called it Crick House, C-R-I-C-K. And then, um, the farm that's on the corner of Stratton Lake Road and Highway 22 had a sign that said our, our folks place. And that's occupied by Tom Olson now. Tom, where is he here tonight? There you are. I thought I saw you come in. Okay. Do you have anything to tell us about the shocks? Okay, well, I thought I'd give you the chance. Oh, okay, and here's a jewel of the township. I mean, now, we don't have 100% of it, but we have most of it in our township is the state park. And um, that's a map, and there's a line just to the right of the first fold, and that's the county line. So all the rest of it, the water, the campground, um, that's all in the town of Dayton. And uh, this is a shelter over there. It has a concession in one end and, and then a, you know picnic tables. This is the beach at Hartman Lake. The lakes over there are man-made lakes from when the property was a, a fish hatchery. This is the Halstead House, which is an adopted landmark. Um, this actually came from the south branch of the Little Wolf River, about eight miles north of Wapaka, but it was brought into the park, and it's in it's in the Dayton side, and uh, it was built by the Halsteads in 1864, and it's the nature center over there. And um, as a matter of fact, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of that being there on October 12th. So if you want to go someplace on Saturday, October 12th, come on over to the park. Um, that's an aerial view of the township. This hangs in the town hall. Uh, this shows you where the intersection of the two rustic roads that we have in the township are, Rural Road and Emmons Creek Road. And just a, you know, very simple bridges we have. Bridges were a big thing recently because we've had to have some replaced, but they weren't replaced with anything very fancy. Uh, we still do have some farms. And uh, many of the former farmlands have been uh, 
transformed into corporate types. I mean, either they're leased or they've been bought outright by bigger companies. Um, Uh, here's the sign at the rural cemetery. And in the rural cemetery, we have the Daytons. Here's Lyman and Rowena and their children. Or um, This is about Alice. I put this in because she was... Uh, uh, town clerk for a long time and uh, very active in the rural community. Another cemetery is the Pleasant Valley Cemetery and uh, over there uh, George and Eleanor Van Horn are interred as well as the Sawyers, Dale and Olive. He was a uh, uh, farmer. If you've ever driven on Olive Dale Lane, that's, that's where they were. And uh, he drove livestock as well as being a, a farmer. And uh, Olive was very active in her church and in the community. Here's the Crystal Lake United Methodist Church down towards the southern end of the of the township and the cemetery down there. This cemetery has a grave of a Civil War veteran of the Confederacy. Private William Barrington, Company C, 18th Mississippi Inventory. Uh, he lived from 1832 to 1924. That was just a nice farmhouse. I thought I should put a, a, something in to represent farming. I mean, between the corporate farms, or at least the corporations taking over, you know, leasing or buying land, uh, obviously we all know some of the farms have been subdivided also. But we still have a really nice countryside, I think, uh, in general. This one is familiar to Helen. This was the Andrew Potts place, which is now the Crystal River Bed and Breakfast. Uh, read, I read that uh, your grandfather was, had the first child born to a settler. First white child. First white child. Okay, here's a little more of the farming. This is a potato storage facility, although I don't think they planted potatoes there. You can see corn in the background. This is this year's picture. And some cranes are helping in the soybeans out there. <laughs> and some more farming. With our sandy soil, we need irrigation. Is this the one? Okay. I keep forgetting to where I'm going on here. That, yeah, you, the first log cabin in the township is what this one is. And that was the thing, the, the early settlers, since most of them came from New England, they were kind of proud of not building log cabins, more the you know the the frame houses like like you see in rural, but um, uh, this is Crystal Lake. Some of the natural wonders of our area, and that's right across the street. Those those two pictures are right across the road from each other. Lake on one side and marshy area on the other side. And there were a whole bunch of birds there the day I was out. More cranes. 
Um, cabbage patch, harvesting the cabbage. And again, showing you that, you know, this, this isn't uh, a f just a little family farm operation. Oh, goodness. Uh, these are some old maps that are over in the town hall. Um, Stratton Lake with its boat landing. Stratton Lake also has a, a camp on it. Um, and here's Rural with its historic sign. Just plain pretty stuff coming up now. Why we like it here, even when there's a blizzard. Look at that. That's outside my bedroom window. That's from a tree that came down in the storm <laughs> covered with ice. And um, one year, there that's a bridge right next to where I live, a tree came right across, I mean, it broke off and it was laying on the road, and, and my husband and another uh, fellow were moving it off the road, and somebody was coming through trying to drive, and oh, she'll just pull off on the shoulder. There was no shoulder. Had to call a tow truck with a big flatbed to pull her out of the ditch. That's a lightning strike on a, on a pine in my yard. This is over at the Hellestead House at the park after that storm of July 20th. They're still, still working really hard over there. By the way, if any of you would like to volunteer, um, they have a call out for volunteers on three upcoming dates to try and still clean up. Um, they lost, they have to put a new roof on one of the shower buildings and they, the campground is just a, a mess. I mean, people can come in there, but it, you wouldn't recognize it if you've been there before. Out by the Hellestead house, that's all that it was. Three trees came down, downhill of the Hellestead house. The house itself is still fine. Just some more, I mean, you can't appreciate it in these, how big some of this stuff that came down is. Right after it was the, they had to close uh, close the the park for a week, and they had already piled up logs to be hauled away. That's what it looks like now. That's somebody camping now, but there's these these piles of brush where they've pulled the stuff out of the campsites and just put it in like the back of the sites until they, that's what they need to clean up and they're looking for volunteers to help. Um, I didn't even know this place existed, but I was doing some research online and lo and behold, it said something about Mud Lake, Radley Creek, I'm like, what? So, um, we have this, this fishery area and, uh, the last uh, paragraph there covers a hundred acres, so it's not small. But you can't get to it. You can't. I mean, the only way you would be able to get into Mud Lake is if you came up through the stream, because there's no access. And it's on off Highway 22, south of the intersection with Highway 10. Here's Radley Creek. This is a real popular one. I can remember when we first came here, you could actually catch trout real easily. Um, this is what it would normally look like in winter, and that's about how wide it is at the bridge at Stratton Lake Road. That's what it was like this spring, a little bit bigger. And I put that in just because you can see how clear it is. You, you know, you see the bottom, it's just gorgeous. Uh, this is our newest uh, facility for watercraft, the canoe and kayak access off of Highway K. And that's where you go down with your little watercraft. 
the Parfreville Wayside. How many of you take guests over there during the summer? It's a fun place to go. Peter Nelson Park now has a very nice bench on it, and um, that little island out there is always a, in, an attractive place to picnic. And it was a real hot button issue when the when the dam was taken out on the Crystal River, but it has turned out so nice, hasn't it? Um, and you do see lots of people kayaking in that area now. Well, here's something else I didn't know we had, dog training area. <laughs> um, that's West Road on the far left, vertically, and then Seuss Road going the other way. And that sort of, sort of triangular area just to the bottom is a dog training area. And what's, oh goodness, okay, the rest is just pretty stuff. All, all things that just caught my eye and I thought, oh, isn't that nice? Oh, if anybody knows what the top middle one is, I have forgotten what it is and I couldn't find it in any of my references, that pretty little purple flower. Wildlife, of course, we're known for deer, and it's been a, a top deer hunting county, uh, Wapaka County, for as long as. I can remember when I was a little kid, we would be going up to Marshfield to visit my grandparents, say, at Thanksgiving time, and we would come through this one town that had men walking around in all these red jackets, and it was Wapaka because, I mean, you went right through. There was no uh, Highway 10 like we have now. And um, so we're still known for deer. I had to put, put a lot of deer in here. Uh, these are some hornet's nests that I thought were attractive. The one on the upper right was actually on the side of our camper. And the monarchs this year are doing well, I think. Last year I hardly ever saw one. This year they're all over the place. Um, some other... That little spider in the lower right it was on one little thread. You can barely see it in the upper left coming down toward the spider. And it spanned from one tree that I'll say was there, and the other one was, well, not as far away as the back of the room, but at least, at least 15 or 20 feet. How it got it there in the first place, I don't know. <laughs> Unless it was, you know, being swung by the wind and kept putting out more silk. I, I'm, I'm totally baffled by that. It was so, so neat, neat. And some amphibians, little hyla stuck on my window. And mama laying the eggs and then actually we saw the hatchlings. Sandhill crane in the lower right. Possum, raccoon, woodchuck. Bambi. That's a fisher. The first time I saw one, I didn't know what it was because I was looking outside and I saw something come down the trunk of a spruce tree not falling down, but coming down head first, fast, and then it scampered away before I could, you know, get a picture of it or anything. I thought, what on earth was that? Well, I found out it was a fisher. And uh, my field guides didn't even show fishers in Wisconsin. They were all north of Lake Superior as their territory. So, But then I got a, a, an email from uh, something that I'm involved in, and it was talking about how many Fisher reports they've had. So I guess the, the range is changing. And here are some of our favorite rodents, a little 13 line ground squirrel and a chipmunk and a red squirrel. Hmm. And then the, the half and half, the front half of that squirrel 
is black, and the back half is gray. And here's one that's all gray and very bold. It was actually on my windowsill looking in. And some fox and coyote and a fox den. That friend visited my yard um, in uh, July of 2013. There were a bunch of us standing in the family room because they were getting ready to go up to Iola to the car show, and my brother-in-law said, there's a big dog in your backyard. <laughs> and he said, wait a minute. Well, it was coming out from behind a tree, and all he saw were some, you know, but it, it looked big. Well, there is the big dog. <laughs> Whoops, wrong arrow again. And a bunch of deer pictures. Um, 104.9, July of 2012. I don't remember the date but I had to take a picture of the thermometer. <laughs> that was the outside temperature. That wasn't like next to my frying pan or something. And pretty snow pictures. And another guy, coyote. That's it. Welcome. If you'd like a bibliography, sometime when you're at the library, you might. Those are all books that are available at the library. Mm -hmm.